In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In December 1894, Captain Alfred Dreyfus, a 35-year-old artillery officer in the French Army, was convicted of treason and sentenced to life in prison. His crime? He gave French military secrets to the German embassy in Paris. He was imprisoned on Devil's Island in French Guiana. French Guiana is a small country on the northeast coast of South America. That is a long, long way from Paris. His conviction caused division in the Third French Republic for more than a decade. Treason is, of course, a big deal. But what did the Dreyfus Affair, as it is known in France, why did it cause a decade of controversy? Because he didn't do it. Two years later, in 1896, Lieutenant Colonel Georges Picard, whose name I'm undoubtedly mispronouncing, he identified the culprit as Major Ferdinand Esterhazy. High-ranking officials, however, suppressed the new evidence, and the military court unanimously acquitted Esterhazy in a two-day trial. They also had more charges for Dreyfus, who remained in the prison on Devil's Island. Picard, who told the truth, was relieved of his command. A growing movement of support for Dreyfus put pressure on the government, and the country became divided between those who supported Dreyfus, called Dreyfusards, and those who condemned him, the anti-Dreyfusards. Dreyfus was returned to France in 1899, three years after his first trial, for another trial. That trial, too, resulted in a conviction. As I said, the affair divided the French for about 12 years. There was even a board game based on the affair published in 1898. Dreyfus was pardoned and released in 1906 and then exonerated. He returned to military service, served in World War I, and died in 1935. The Dreyfus Affair is regarded as a notable example of a complex miscarriage of justice. The innocent one is condemned, and the real criminal is acquitted. Today's Gospel has some things in common with the Dreyfus Affair. Just as in Holy Week, we are still living things out in real time, as we will through Pentecost. Our Gospel begins on Easter night, but the crux of it takes place eight days later. That is, it takes place on the first Sunday after Easter day, which is today. Today's gospel shows controversy, as did the Dreyfus affair. Resurrection from the dead is not something easy to believe, and was, of course, controversial. Even Thomas, the one whose question led to Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life, even Thomas does not believe. And we know from other passages that the resurrection of our Lord has caused controversy, not just for 12 years, as did the Dreyfus affair, but for 2,000 years. Another thing today's gospel and the Dreyfus affair have in common I've already alluded to. The innocent one is condemned, and the criminal is acquitted. The innocent Dreyfus was sentenced to life in prison. The criminal Esterhazy is acquitted. Our innocent Lord was condemned. The criminal Barabbas was released. But our gospel goes beyond the mere exoneration of the Dreyfus affair, just as the sentence of execution was beyond Alfred Dreyfus's sentence to imprisonment on Devil's Island. Our gospel shows not exoneration, but resurrection. And not just any resurrection, but a resurrection to display God's justice in the midst of injustice. Everything's not right with the world. That's easy to tell these days, right? The Dreyfus affair shows us that not everything's right with the world. But the resurrection of our Lord, in the resurrection, God is putting things right. Our gospel begins on the evening of that day, that is, Easter day. The disciples are locked behind doors in fear of the Jews. Jesus shows up and greets them with, peace be with you. In just three verses, our Lord does some very important things, each of which is a sermon in itself. So I'm only going to mention them. First of all, he sends them. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. Second, he breathes the Holy Spirit on them. And third, he gives them authority to forgive sins or not. As I said, each of those is a sermon or even a book all by themselves. So if you have any questions about them, please schedule a Zoom call with Father Doran. The next section of our gospel takes place eight days later, that is, on the Sunday after the resurrection. Thomas had not been there the week before and was stuck in unbelief. 
For centuries, of course, poor Thomas has been branded Doubting Thomas. But I don't see the word doubt anywhere in our text. Thomas wasn't guilty of doubt, which may or may not be a sin. No, Thomas was guilty of unbelief, which is a sin and a grave one. As I was considering this, I wondered if Thomas might be in disbelief rather than unbelief. I was reminded of a constant controversy, although a very minor controversy it was, a controversy regarding the difference between the prefix un, as in unbelief, and the prefix dis, as in disbelief. This controversy happened while I was in college every time I would go through the cafeteria line in my dorm with my friend Jeff Schwartz. In our dorm cafeteria, and at all the dorms in Indiana, the vegetables were offered either with butter or without butter. Invariably, if you ask for peas or green beans or corn, the student server would ask, buttered or unbuttered? Schwartz, a business major, not an English major, as I was, he would correct the server. They're not unbuttered, he would say. To be unbuttered, they would have to be buttered first. Have you removed the butter from those peas? This would then be followed by dinner conversation regarding the preciseness of language, which I, being an English major, took great delight in. But I digress. What Thomas had was unbelief, according to Schwartz's usage, that is. Thomas had believed in Jesus. He, like all the disciples, had left his job and followed Jesus around for about three years. That takes belief, total trust and commitment, right? Now that belief is gone or missing or taking a break. But not for long. When Jesus appears on the eighth day, Thomas rightly addresses him as my Lord and my God. As important as the first two sections of today's gospel are, the last two verses are where I'd like to focus today. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Jesus did many other signs which are not written in this book. This is St. John talking about what he's written. This is chapter 20 of 21 chapters in John's Gospel. He's bringing things to a conclusion, and he, St. John, is telling us why he's written this. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Writ written that you may believe, and then in believing you may have life. Let's talk about signs first. What are signs for? Signs point to something, right? Like 5 South, San Diego, or 78 East, Escondido. Or signs tell us to do something like stop, or yield, or no parking. St. John has told us about seven signs in his gospel. The first is at the wedding at Cana, where our Lord turns water into wine. The last is at Bethany, where Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. In between, he brought life to a nobleman's son. He healed an invalid on the Sabbath. He, led, he fed 5,000 men with just five loaves and two fish. He walks on water, and he heals a man born blind. In these signs, our Lord shows that he has authority over the elements, he changes water to wine. He walks on water. He has authority over physical ailments. He makes the lame to walk. He makes the blind see. And our Lord is the giver of life. He raises Lazarus from the dead. John calls these signs. Others call them miracles. John calls them signs because they give direction. They point the way. They point the way, but they are not the way. You have not been to San Diego if you have just driven by the sign showing you the on-ramp, right? In the same way, those at the wedding at Cana did not believe because they drank the wine that had been water. In fact, in that story, John only tells us that the disciples believed. Many drank the wine, many benefited from the sign, that is, but not everyone followed the sign. The sign leads to Jesus. The resurrection of Lazarus also was a sign. Mary and Martha and others got a few more years of enjoying Lazarus' company. Good for them, right? Again, however, Lazarus' longer life is not the destination. Jesus is the destination. And because Lazarus lived again, St. John tells us that many believe in Jesus, but not everyone. Others go to the religious authorities and tell them about the sign. 
those authorities recognize that the problem is not the sign, but Jesus. They say, if we let him go on thus, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and destroy both our holy place and our nation. It's the same today, isn't it? Many of us are more interested in the things Jesus does for us than we are in the Lord himself. That is, we're more interested in the blessings of God than we are in God himself. When Jesus fed the 5,000, the people ran after him. Our Lord rebukes them. You seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. A few verses later, they ask him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answers them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. They respond, not, what, not with belief, but with a request for yet another sign. And we're all aghast, right? What's wrong with these people? They just saw Jesus feed 5,000 with a box lunch, and they want more? When will these people get with it? Well, folks, that's what I call a Romans 2-1 experience, and I have them all the time. Romans 2-1 says, You have no excuse, O man, wherever you are, when you judge another. For in passing judgment upon him, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, are doing the very same things. That's right. As slow as some of the people were in our Lord's presence, you and I are often just as slow or even slower. But the God we worship is a great God, a healer of the sick, a provider for the poor, a companion for the lonely. He's the creator of the universe, the one who made the stars, and he is the one setting things right, taking injustice and making it just, and he's doing that through our Lord Jesus Christ. In my dining room hangs a photograph of a sunset. It's a large photograph. I had it blown up to what they call poster size many years ago. I took it in the summer of 1992 off the Olympic Peninsula in Washington. It was, in fact, the first time I had ever seen the Pacific Ocean having grown up in the Midwest. When people enter my apartment and see the photograph, they often make comments about what a beautiful sunset it must have been. They assume the sunset's beauty from the beauty of the photograph, but they weren't there at that sunset in 1992 off the Olympic Peninsula. The sunset was, in fact, not at all noteworthy. I am a very amateur photographer and was hoping to get a photo of a sunset over the Pacific on my first sight of that ocean. But it had been a cloudy day and wet, like the Pacific Northwest often is, it was pretty dreary. But I saw a break in the clouds over the water, and I figured that at some point the sun would peek through those clouds. As it did, I snapped about a dozen photos. One, and only one, as the water reflecting the sun in a profound way, and that's the one I enlarged and framed of hanging in my dining room. It's probably the best photograph I have of a sunset, but it's not the best sunset I've ever seen. It's way down the list. Around the large photo in my dining room, I have three smaller sunset photographs framed. One is from Waikiki Beach in Hawaii, one is from Coronado with Point Loma in the background, and the third is of the Ocean Beach Pier. They're all good photos, but not as good as the photo from the Olympic Peninsula. The sunsets they represent, however, were much, much more spectacular. Our tendency is to enjoy the photograph more than we do the sunset. Most of the time, however, the power and glory of the, of the sunset are not capable of being captured. They need to be experienced, don't they? The same is true of us and God. You're watching this sermon via the internet, and I hope you're benefiting from doing that. But I assure you, this sermon would be much better if we were together in the church or here in the chapel. An image on a screen, no matter how handsome, is not the same as being in the presence of that person. Fortunately, our Lord is not limited by time and space. And that's what we mean when we say that God is eternal. And we recognize this every time we say to each other, the Lord be with you, as we often do. No, God is not limited by time and space. How could the creator, redeemer, and sustainer of the universe be contained? Well, he was, right? God became a man and dwelt among us, and in doing so, he revealed the glory of the Father, full of grace and truth. How could the redeemer and giver of life be contained in grave clothes, in a tomb with a heavy stone to block the door, 
with a Roman guard stationed to make sure his body wasn't stolen. Thank God, the giver of life, the Lord of glory, is risen. All is not right with the world, but God is putting things right, and he's doing that through Jesus. Alleluia, Christ is risen, the Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia.